Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 Character Class Showcase. And today, we're going to be focusing on Incursor, a wonderful, wonderful attacker class that emphasizes critical hit ratios and crit damage. There is a lot to love about this particular class, and one thing I like about this especially is that it is an Actian class that emulates the feel of playing Xenoblade 2 all over again. That's right, similarly to the Ashera class that we did the other day, I wanted to emphasize a particular hero class that is very, very potent outside of Chain Attacks, mostly just because they want to be effective in active play on the field, and that's exactly what we're going to see with the Incursor today. Wonderful damage, a wonderful presence, and a lot of fun to play as too. So I did mention some similarities to the Ashera class, which of course was a Kavesi class. The thing about the Incursor is that as long as you were constantly cancelling your attack damage, you're going to get your cooldowns real, real quick due to the fact that Agni and classes recharge if you successfully cancel one art into another or if you cancel after doing an auto attack. The nice thing about this particular class is that even though it already comes built in with a high critical rate, it is possible to increase that with accessories and skills, but you don't actually have to necessarily do that. You can afford to change up your accessories, go for something that is a little bit more effective, a little bit more consistent, due to the fact that there are passive skills that increase the critical rate for this particular class on top of what it already comes packed in with. So it should be fairly self-explanatory. This is going to be very similar to the build that I had with the Ashera Lone Exile. Uh, basically, we're going to be emphasizing attack canceling and not really on chain attacks. So it's going to be reflected here. Going to the gems, it's pretty obvious what you want to have. Analyze weakness for that additional critical hit damage, which is insanely good considering how high the critical hit rate becomes for this class after extended play. Then we also have the Steel Cleaver. More attack damage is something that everyone wants, and you're definitely going to want it here. I think you'll want it for basically every attacker in the game regardless. And then we have the Empowered Combo. This one boosts the damage of attacks if you cancel them by a good 75%. Since you're going to be doing this often, there are so many multipliers at play, which we'll be getting into, and will become more apparent as we explore this build moving forward. So, going over to the accessories, I have this Attorney Rings. This just boosts your attack by 40%, so as you can see on the screen, Uni has a sizable 1456 in attack power. And then we have the Chaotic Memory, which means that arts that are cancelled into cannot be blocked or evaded. Now, there is a bit of a caveat to this one. It is possible for the Dreadworm Nizunt boss to still be invincible, so anything that uh, it counts as a block or evade, the Chaotic Memory will guarantee a hit if you cancel into them, but if it's something that is invincible, then it will not work. It's kind of annoying, but that is a very closed-off scenario, so just keep that in mind if you find yourself fighting against them. You'll still have to play in the Zunes game when he starts going for his shenanigans. And then finally, we have the Warps White Brooch. Now, usually you would consider the Fiber Wraps. I would say that Fiber Wraps, which give you bonus damage against launched enemies, would be good in the context of Chain Attacks. But because we're not emphasizing that, the thing about the Incursor, it already does a fair amount of damage as it is, and then launch damage will be even better as a result of that by far. But we can switch it out for the Warped White Brooch, which ignores 30% of the enemy's physical defense whenever you attack, and I do believe that this actually stacks with the Ultimate Tiagong ability, which is something that you get from the Thaumaturge, and you stack these two together. I don't believe they stack uh, multiplicatively or additively. I'm not entirely sure how they do, but having them both at the same time does make a difference, and it's something that is worth considering for accommodating this particular uh, playstyle that we'll be going into. Now, going over to the skills, the passive skills, I have Critical Strike. I believe you get this one from the Sword Fighter. Oh, sorry, you get this from the Flash Fencer, and of course, this is not critical rates, this is critical hit damage bonus, and this will stack with the gem. And then we have Protector's Pride, I, like, you know, I'm kind of obsessed with this skill, it's such a wonderful, wonderful skill. Uh, even though it's meant for defensive purposes, the fact that you can use this for attackers and healers, and you're going to be accruing a lot of aggro playing as the Incursor anyways, so, yeah, similarly to what happened with the Ashera build, we're going to be expecting a lot of aggro coming our way, whether we like it or not. We're going to be kind of 
kind of detracting from our tank, although we will be keeping a tank just to stay safe, but the fact that we are going to be expecting this means that our offensive presence is going to be even better. And as mentioned before, Ultimate Tiagong, you're going to want this just because the 50% that you ignore is too good to pass up, and you can combine that with a 30% for a decent amount of damage that you will be getting even more of. Okay, so going over to the arts, this is a uh, fairly straightforward what you can see me trying to go for here. Aerial Slash, this is good because it gives you evade. You won't be relying on it too much, but it is fun. It's more of a fun skill than a vital skill. That being said, though, there isn't really that much in the way of alternatives. Reversal Edge is, like, okay. I mean, you get critical rate against enemies performing arts, that's nice, but you won't be thinking about that too much. It's better to focus on survivability, which you get from the evasion frames. And then Mystic Vision is a buff, but I'd rather you just have everything as attack, because regardless, you're going to be getting a lot of critical rates and damage from everything else that the Incursor has to offer. So yeah, Aerial Slash, I usually use this one. If you find yourself against certain bosses that telegraph their abilities, or if you get very, very used to seeing the boss's movesets, you may wish to use that actively, saving the cooldown for when those things happen. That being said, though, the Signifer does provide plenty of buffs that prevent Uni from getting killed outright, so honestly, uh, use this at your discretion. Don't rely on it too much, but it is nice to use in a pinch situation or just for fun. Glitter Stream, it's your break. Having break is a nice bonus. We don't want to accommodate the break brooch, unfortunately, but if you do want to do that, if you want to switch out one of your accessories for this, then feel free, but I would just save that for the much lower leveled enemies anyways. And then Sidewinder, lots of crit damage, and just good damage all, it, um, all in all. It's an AoE. Uh, yeah, nothing really more that needs to be said here. I had the Cross Impact. This is a wonderful, wonderful skill from the Flash Fencer. You give yourself Power Charge, meaning that you will do even more damage, and that's exactly why you're playing the Incursor in the first place. So definitely go for the Flash Fencer, get your Cross Impact, and then move on. The Guardian Commander's Shield Batch is also a good option. It works really, really well with the Glitter Stream, and if you have any other party members with Break, it is nice to get that opportunity, give you guys all some breathing room, prevent the boss from moving, hit them with that top wall, and then follow it up with a Soaring Tempest from the Lone Exile. And it's pretty obvious why you want to have this. It hits multiple times too, and you'll notice that the skills of the Incursor do give you more damage or more attributes the more you hit enemies, so a multi-hit is always nice to have and very hard to find on the Incursor anyway. So the ability to launch is never is never unwelcome, simply because you get more damage from this anyways. Uh, there's a recurring theme here. The recurring theme is damage for uh, the Incursor, and you're going to be doing lots of it. So I think that's all I can really say about the Incursor class. It's a lot of fun, it's a very risky play, but as long as you're using this in conjunction with the Signifer class, you're going to just put out a lot of buffs and give yourself a lot of survivability, and it'll become quite usable even when you're fighting against the super bosses on hard difficulty, which is what we're going to be doing a little bit today. Now, in terms of the rest of the party, there isn't really much else that needs to be said. I got myself a uh, Full Metal Jaguar. I actually could change this to an Ogre, give ourselves some more break potential, so... Okay, so I've decided to switch Noah to an Ogre because that would be much more useful for our purposes anyway. Uh, as you can see, we have a Break Brooch Gust Bracelet to give us all of the uh, launch topple combos uh, immediately, as well as the Memory Lockets. I should probably switch out the Myopic screen, but uh, yeah, the Memory Locket allows him to revive even though he's not a healer. I have Mio as the defender, not really much else that can be said just give her some more survivability, let her dodge things. Uni is eventually going to be taking the aggro anyway, but if she ends up fainting, then what we could do is rely on Mio to defend for a bit while Tyon and Lance go for the revives. And then we have Tyon as our signifer, fraternal badge, crystal earrings, gust bracelets, as well as all the usual goodies that we have, cross impacts with resonant flag to give power charge to everyone in the team, heal harmony, advanced cooldown to fill up the talent gauge as fast as possible. We are going to be relying on Cry of Faith quite a bit, and passing on those buffs to Uni so that she can survive even when she has aggro on her. Lance is a very similar case, we also gave him the Break Brooch, as well as a Break, Topple, and Launch combo, just so we can have that extra avenue for launch combos to kind of keep the battle under control against a single target. 
And finally, there is our Soul Hacker, our other, our other source of damage. She also has a Break, Launch, and Smash combo, which we will be making use of. It's very, very powerful. We definitely want to have extra damage on our team, but because it's controlled by an AI, it won't be as consistent as when I start controlling Uni. Now, in terms of talking about Alexandra herself, she's fine. Uh, in a similar fashion to Grey, she is quite decent in the form of chain attacks, but when it comes to having someone on the team, it is best to have a little bit more support, especially when you're emphasizing one character that's going to be putting out a lot of damage all by herself. So personally, for today's video, I'm going to be switching out Alexandria. I don't have anything against her, I like her, but we're going to be switching her out for Miyabi. Miyabi is a wonderful support unit and one that honestly is going to be very very useful when fighting against higher difficulty attacks or higher difficulty battles simply because of her passive abilities so yeah look forward to that but other than that though there isn't really much else i can say we're going to be fighting against a couple of targets just to showcase how awesome the incursor class is this class is a lot of fun too if you really enjoy the active movement that was afforded to you in Xenoblade 3 with the quick steps and all that stuff. Uh, you're going to be using that quite a bit since you need to reposition constantly after doing the uh, aerial slash from this particular class anyways. So yeah, hope to see you guys there. Okay, so the very first order of business is to fight against Leviathan Lord Imperio in the Aegis Sea. Now, this is a really, really interesting fight because this particular guy has a lot of area effects abilities, meaning that even if the tank has full control over the aggro, there is still the possibility that there is going to be death. But thankfully, we do have signifers on our team, two signifers to be exact, so hopefully survivability will be a little bit more reasonable in this encounter, and I hope it's kind to us, because luck does play a bit of a role when you're playing things on hard mode, especially these super bosses over here. Okay, so, start things off with the Cry of Faith. Go for the Oriole first, pass on all the buffs. Uni is already dead, but that's okay, because while someone is going off reviving, I'm gonna start building up some Cry of Faith still. Kind of builds up that immunity. Now, I'm trying to get specific buffs, particularly the ones that give more evasion. So hopefully, Noah playing as an ogre will give us a little bit more of that. There's that launch, and the smash. Slowly make our way towards getting some more of those buffs with a cry of faith. Again, luck does play a bit of a factor in this one, but thankfully... Thankfully, the launch combos are doing very well for us right now. Okay, perfect. So, now we have our buffs all set up. And I can switch over to Uni. And whenever Uni faints, I can just go ahead, switch over to Tyon, and reapply the buffs if I lose them. So whenever I begin the Onslaught with Uni, I always start with the Power Charge, because the Power Charge is too useful to not use. Oh yeah, and that Smash Damage is really coming in handy too. And we're just getting all of our cancels down. And if we get the aggro, good for us. Alright, so quickly... The more we do attacks the more damage we're going to end up getting. Look at all that damage that we're putting out, man. Oh, and we get bonus damage with the Talon's Arts, if we can get it in time. Okay, so things are going really, really well for us. We got a topple, I'm gonna go for the launch, and then immediately go back to the onslaught. Look at all that damage that Yuna's putting out, man. Absolutely fantastic. I wish I could have gotten those talents much, much faster. And thanks to all those buffs that we got too, evasion is pretty like is pretty likely for us. Okay, so now Uni is dead. So while that's happening, 
I'm gonna start working on giving Tyon some buffs. Oh, okay, never mind. We avenged the uni. That was really, really fast, but thankfully we were able to get it done. But as you can see, though, that's a lot of damage that uni's putting out there. And that was a really, really quick one, too. How fast was that particular fight? I didn't even know. Oh yeah, that fight was two and a half minutes, which is pretty decent. Obviously, it could be faster, but for hard mode, not bad. So, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and fight against another super boss, this time one that is on the land. So, please look forward to that. Well, we're really doing this. We're going to fight against Seraphic Seratinia. I was thinking of fighting against Nizunes for this video, but I do know that I fought against him in the last video that I did, which was the Full Metal Jaguar, so I want to avenge myself, I want to redeem myself a little bit, because I've, that was a lot harder than it needs to be, but this time, we're going to use a party that can do this. So here we go. Okay. Okay, keep a close eye on those buffs. Make sure that Tyon has that purple life bar. Keep those buffs going. Ooh, wow, it seems like everyone except Tyon and Uni have that purple buff. Come on. Roll that dice, man. It's what we like. It is nice to finally have a party that can properly take on Seratini, I gotta say. It feels much better. Now it's time for Uni. I couldn't get the I couldn't get the cancel in time, but look at that damage, eh? There we go, give you guys a little bit of a better view, shall we? Here we go. Get your cancels down again. Oh yeah, we gotta be able to get a launch in the middle of that too. Nice. Someone go for the topple, thank you. Alright, we're no longer playing Xenoblade, we're playing Elden Ring now. Here we go. Fighting as a giant dog from Elden Ring. That damage output that she has is ridiculously good. Look at her go! <laughs> And there's the evade. Woo, boy, this is so exciting. <laughs> Launch. This is what it's all about. Oh my goodness, this is such terrible commentary. I'm not really saying much, but I think the results speak for themselves. That this class is fantastic. I cannot wait for him to pull out the rug from under me. Uh, switch over to Tyon. So I just want to get that buff back from Tyon. Just laying on that damage. Ooh, and there we go. The bubble had to burst eventually. Oh man, I want to switch over to Uni to get that final blow, come on! There we go. <laughs> Beautiful. Picture perfect ending. Alright, but yeah, that's pretty much all you need to say. How fast was that in comparison to what we usually did? I think last time... well, what we saw in the last video. 
3 minutes and 19 seconds, not bad considering that there was no need for chain attacks. So it kind of goes to show that we're starting to de-emphasize chain attacks a bit as we kind of learn more and more about this game. But the wonderful thing about the Incursor is that you can really, really go to town. Um, on, even on hard difficulty, go to town on enemies, even if you draw aggro to yourself. Because we have the Protector's Pride ability from the Guardian Commander, we could really take advantage of that. And honestly, full disclosure, all of the attempts that I did for today's video, they were all in the first try, so that really goes to show how potent this strat is. Start things off with the Signifer, give them all the buffs, and then have Uni really show them who's boss. And that's that's a whole wonderful thing about this game, is all that build potential. So, yeah, guys, thank you very, very much for watching today's video. It's a lot of fun, really brief, but that's just how it goes with the Incursor. You're putting out so much damage that, of course, fights are going to go by real, real quick. But uh, I enjoyed it every step of the way. So thank you very much for joining me on today's episode of the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 Hero Class Showcase. Maybe in the future, we'll actually have Alexandria in the video for a change. So I uh, hope you guys look forward to that too. But until then, take care everyone.